the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the epistle today, we hear St. Paul saying, being reviled, be blessed, be persecuted, be suffered, or we endure it. And I can think of very few better examples of that other than Christ himself than the saint that is celebrated today, one of the saints that is celebrated today, St. Tikhon, the wonder worker of Zadonsk. St. Tikhon is a great example of the gospel. His whole life is dedicated to the gospel and dedicated to Christ. He had this burning love for Christ. When you read his writings, he comes forth in his musings on every day that he would quote the Psalter frequently as he knew it by heart and crying out that he would see the face of God. Every day for him was about that, how to see the face of God, how to come into the presence of God. And St. Tikhon lived a life which is, well, for us would be rather unusual for most of us, maybe not for some, he also is an example of this doesn't come out by prayer, but by prayer and fasting because he knew his own weaknesses and he knew that he had to conquer his own unbelief and his own struggles and his own doubts to be able to help others around him, physician, cure thyself. And Tikhon took that very seriously. It wasn't the things that were easy for him that he sought to conquer. He sought to conquer the things that he knew were his biggest problems or difficulties for himself. He was a human just like the rest of us. So Tikhon was born in 1724, to put him into context for you, and he was very poor. And when the father dies off, he needed somewhere to live, and the mother was about willing to give him over to someone for service, and the brother stopped this and insisted that this wouldn't happen. And they struggled, and they struggled, and struggled, that Tikhon would be able to go to school, because it wasn't possible in the situation. And Tikhon ended up going to school, Timothy was his name at the time, and he had to struggle mightily because he didn't have money like the other kids. He often would sell even the very food he had, most of it, so he could have candles to sit up and read at night. He loved to read John Chrysostom. People would make fun of him because of the bath shoes that he wore around. He was a very poor man. And they would sense him, put a, a shoe on a string, and sense him to call him Vadik because all he ever did was study. Now, years later, when these same people that were sensing him with the bath shoe, were sensing him, he was getting out of the coach as the bishop of Voronezh. Some of them were mortified at what might happen to them then. But Tikhon just chuckles and loves them. He knew their weaknesses, and he was, not, he was humbled by these things. He took it with humility. Being reviled, he blessed. Being persecuted, he endured. One of the famous stories, of course, in St. Tikhon's life is when he gets into a debate with a man who is a follower of Voltaire, and Tikhon soundly defeats him by his wisdom, which is the wisdom of God, really. And the man slaps Tikhon across the face onto the ground. This is the bishop of Voronezh. In Russia, this is not a small thing to strike a bishop. Tikhon prostrates himself before the man and asks his forgiveness for bringing him to that kind of anger. Now, did Tikhon do anything wrong? No, certainly not. But he knew always to look to himself and not to look to the sins of others, to look to his own heart and what needed curing. Tikhon was a rather high-strung man and had a bit of a temper. I can relate to some of it. Tikhon wanted things done, and Tikhon grew greatly impatient when things weren't done properly in church, when things weren't done properly by his priests. He inherited a diocese that was full of drunks and illiterates amongst the clergy. Imagine what the lay people were like. That was their leadership. And he did everything he could to cure this, to bring those priests to repentance, and if not, to remove them. To still try to bring them to repentance. To bring them to a place to educate them. That was his big goal, was to educate everyone, because the people did not know their faith. It was superstition. He got rid of some of the pagan festivals that existed, still. This is in the 1700s. And he labored mightily to the point where it compromised his own health, where he was frequently sick, frequently ill. It strained him so much because he cared so deeply for the people of Christ. He loved the people that were around him and thought constantly what he could do to help them. Now, Tikhon, after doing this for many years, and he made great progress with these people, of course, but he still had his detractors. And he, makes great comments about when you love people, how they will treat you, as much as Christ was. You try to pray and they call you a, a zealot and crazy. 
And that's what he did. He tried to fast and say, you're a Pharisee. And he tried to do those things for everyone, teach them the right ways of the faith. Peacock can be rather abrupt with the clergy sometimes. He would always ask for forgiveness, but he wanted things done properly. He wanted things done for the sake of the glory of God. Now, Peacock one day, finally, after begging and begging and begging, gets a blessing to retire. He's a young man in his 40s, I believe, when he finally would go into retirement, to reclusion, much like Theophon the Recluse. But Peacock had no more strength. He had worn himself completely down. Most priests can relate to this on some level. And he finally retires until 1783 he lived, only to 59 when he died. But in those years of reclusion, the monks didn't understand him either. They wanted somebody not quite as strict as he was, not quite as serious. But he can live very simply, even as a bishop. He had a minimum of cassocks, a minimum of vestments. Most of the time, serving as a bishop in his reclusion, he would just simply put on a felonium with an omophoriate around it, like in the ancient church. Really said he longed for the Greek way of doing things, where things were a little more simple, and he could just be unknown, instead of being the Russian bishop. But he wrote prolifically. He is referred to as the Chrysostom of Russia, and that is not without reason. He was quite the preacher, and wrote, the only thing in English is the journey to heaven. You can find that from Holy Trinity Monastery Press if you want to read that. The basics of the Christian life, just the fundamentals of the Christian life. Interpreted the scriptures. Most of what he quotes in his writings are the scriptures. The Psalms, Isaiah, he loved Isaiah. And when they would read Isaiah when he was eating meals every night, often he would break down in tears before they would finish, especially when the parts about the suffering servant. Peacock would go out in his reclusion dressed as a simple monk at night and go around to visit the poor, try to find the poor, to feed them, so he would be unrecognized. On Pascha, he always went to the jail to say, Christ is risen to the people that were in prison. That was his celebration of Pascha. He was a wonderful man. He wasn't understood by the world. This was not the normal man. This was not someone that was looking for power. This was not somebody that was looking to be seen. This was somebody that really disappeared into himself. So one day as he's praying out of his bench in his garden, he would tell people to cough before they came up to him, because sometimes he would be that entranced in prayer that he would not know people were there. People would see him glowing with light occasionally. One day he's doing this, and a local fool for Christ, Kamenyev, comes up to him, slaps him across the face, this seems to be a theme in Tico's life, and says, don't be so high-minded. Don't be haughty. This was Tico. He never acted high-minded and haughty. Tikhon from that day forward gave him money every single day, three kopecks every day, thanked him for what he had done to bring him to further humility. Now what an example we have in this man. I pointed out se several examples of a man who by prayer and fasting was able to not revile those around him but bless them, as harsh as they were. And some of the people were very harsh. He was able to endure when being persecuted, as he often was. And after he dies, it was a very short period before he was glorified by the Russian church. It usually takes hundreds of years. It was mere decades. And wonders began coming forth from his tomb instantly. Miracles were there. Because Tikhon gave everything he had to Christ. He often fell into despair which is a lot of those who are in reclusion rather often, people that are solitary. But he saw it, though, as a mark of the grace of God, unlike most people in the world. Because in that despair, in those moments of darkness, it drew him deeper into prayer. That is not a worldly thing. That is not a secular type of despair where we just think about ourselves. This is one who was drawn even more deeply into God and longed more and more for Christ, his true Lord. Now, Tikhon left a will to be read at his death, and I want to, I want to read that to you, and I'll leave you with that. Tikhon, it's a remarkable thing. It should be an example for us having the will if we are inclined to do such. This was read at his funeral. Glory to God, for he has created me in his image and likeness. Glory to God, who redeemed me, the fallen one. 
Glory to God, for he was the providence of my unworthy self. Glory, for he called me a sinner to repentance. Glory, for he has handed to me his holy word as a lamp shining in a dark place, and by it he taught me the true way. Glory to God, for he has illumined the eyes of my heart. He has granted me to know his holy name. Glory to God, for he has washed away my sins in the waters of baptism. Glory, for he has shown me the way to eternal bliss. And this is the, the way is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Glory to him, for he did not ruin me in my sin, but in his mercy was patient to my transgressions. <coughs> Glory to God, for he has shown to me the vain enticements and vanity of this world. Glory to God, for he has helped me in the multitude of temptations, griefs, and tribulations. Glory, for he has preserved me in accidents and mortal dangers. Glory to God, for he has defended me from the enemy Satan. Glory, for he has raised me when I fell. Glory to God, for he has comforted me in my affliction. Glory to God, for when I erred, he converted me. Glory to God, for like a father, he punished me. Glory to God, for he showed me his dreadful judgment that I might be afraid and repent of my sins. Glory to God, for he revealed to me eternal pain and eternal bliss, that I might flee the one and seek the other. Glory to him, for to me the unworthy he gave food to strengthen the weakness of the body. He gave me clothes to cover the nakedness of my body, gave me a house in which to rest. Glory to God for all the other benefits which he gave to me for my sustenance and comfort. As many breaths I have taken, so many graces I have received of him. Glory to God for everything. That's pretty powerful in itself, that part. Everything in his life, everything that came, he gave glory to God for. And that is what we are called to do as Christians. But he continues, Today, my brethren, I address my words to you. I cannot talk to you as before with my lips and voice, for I am without breath and without voice. But I converse through this brief letter. First, the temple of my body is demolished, and as dust is given to dust according to the word of God. Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. But with the holy church I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. My hope sits at the right hand of God, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. He is my resurrection and my life. He tells me, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth in me, even if he be dead, shall live again. He will wake me who am asleep with his all-powerful voice. Secondly, I have departed from you in the way of all flesh, and have gone away, and already we do not see each other as before. But we shall see each other there, where all the nations that have lived from the beginning of the world till its end will gather. Lord, show us mercy, that we may meet there where God is seen face to face, where those who see are made alive, comforted in joy, gladness, and eternal bliss. There do men shine like the sun. There is true life. There true honor and glory. There gladness and joy. There true blessedness and all that is eternal and endless. Lord, let thy mercy be upon us, we have put our trust in thee. Thirdly, to my benefactors who have not abandoned me in need and sickness, but in their charity and mercy have provided me with all sorts of goods, many thanks. May God reward them on the day when each will receive according to his deeds. Fourthly, all who in any way, whatever have offended me, I have forgiven, and I do forgive. May God forgive them too in his grace. I beg you also to forgive me if perchance I, being human, have offended someone. Forgive, and it shall be given to you, says the Lord. Fifthly, as I had no possession, I leave nothing behind. I beg those who have lived with me and have served me to exact nothing. Forgive, my beloved ones, and remember Tikhon in your prayer, your well-wisher Tikhon, unworthy bishop. Axios, most worthy bishop Tikhon. Amen. Amen.